Okay. okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, June 2nd, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Dr. David Brin. David, it's very nice to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you, and for putting up with my um, inadequate voice. No, no worries. No worries at all. I, I, I have a summer cold. I have done several tests, and I don't have the crud. But there's other types of crud. That's right. That's right. David, to start, would you please tell me your title and any institutional affiliations you might have? Well, I am currently on the um, advisory council of NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program, NIAC, which is NASA's sort of mini micro uh, DARPA for looking into um, projects that are just this side of science fiction. At least a couple a year turn out to be wonderful contributions, and at least once, one per year later turn out to be a head smacker. What were we thinking? And that's about the right mixture for something that uh, spends a little bit of money on speculative things. But then again, I, I earn the rest of my living um, as, a specul as an author of speculative fiction. Um, uh, also, nonfiction works. Um, and a uh, fair amount of public speaking about the future. David, when you were in graduate school, were you on an academic track? Did you want to get a PhD in astronomy because you thought that would be a great path to, to, to writing? Well, I did the things in parallel. When I was at Caltech, I soon learned that the best scientists all have part-time artistic pastimes. Uh, uh, Murray Gelman was a, a student of Joyce and uh, obscure English literature and history, Greco-Roman history. Uh, uh, Richard Feynman played the bongos and painted. Um, I, I was told by my father that he took me to see Einstein play the violin when I was three. I have no memory of it, but uh, it always struck me that, and I, when I give commencement speeches, I tell students, that they should always try to be many. You can be more than one thing. Now, science is the thing that you have to pay attention to, <coughs> pardon me, by daylight, you have to collaborate with others. Um, you have to work by a schedule. So if you are both a scientist and an artist, art is something that you can put off for evenings, weekends, uh, it doesn't mean you're prioritizing science higher. <sighs> Sorry about that. Okay. Imagine you could edit. Call from spam risk. Call from spam risk. Oh boy. Call from. Um. Okay. Uh, even if you allocate your brain equally between art and science. Science is what you have to do by daylight. It's what you have to focus on in collaborative efforts and, um, and with time and discipline. Art, as it happens, as history shows, can be pursued part-time and uh, with, with often very good results. Um, while I was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft after graduating from Caltech, and then while I was a graduate student in astrophysics at UCSD under Hannes Alfvén, um, I pursued my art, weekends, evenings, uh, and my first novel was published uh, during grad school when I was working on my PhD. It helped pay for my PhD, and I had every intention of continuing along academic tracks. But my second novel was such a hit um, that it became clear that uh, civilization valued my art a bit more than they valued my science. Who am I to argue with civilization? <laughs> David, in what way did your academic trajectory inform the kind of writing that you wanted to do, the topics you wanted to explore? Well, um, very few, uh, only maybe 10% of science fiction authors are scientists. Um, or scientifically extensively trained. Uh, all science fiction authors, or almost all, 
um, are deeply imbued in the greatest story of them all called history. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's this fantastically tragic, dramatic tale of generation after generations of humans clawing their way out of mud and caves and terrible mistakes, some of them very well intentioned, to the point where we can stand on all of their shoulders and create shoulders platforms for others to reach out to the stars. Uh, science fiction should have been called speculative fiction, a speculative history, sorry because it speculates about possible extensions of that dr drama, that dramatic, uh, the dramatic story, which is history. Uh, so it's not surprising that most science fiction authors are imbued in history. I am. I mean, I've, I've read as much history as I have uh, physics, uh, and I find it just as fascinating. Um, there are some science fiction authors out there like Nancy Kress, Sheila Finch, um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Greg Bear, who can do very scientifically informed science fiction. Um, simply, even though they were English majors and could not do a um, differential equation if their life depended on it and they had five years. Um, but they um, know how to visit a nearby university and use pizza and beer to get any expert to um, provide any context that they need for their story. So it's a synergy, of course, because many scientists claim that they were inspired by science fiction. I should point out that the... Um, the it's said that our job is not so much to predict the future as it is to prevent it and i'm going to show you a copy of my uh recently published nonfiction tome uh vivid tomorrows mm -hmm. which uh was published by mcfarland uh and it's about the notion that if we um if we didn't have hollywood science fiction warnings this species would probably not exist right now. We probably all would have died of the failure modes that were warned about in science fiction. But um, that's a point worth arguing. David, do you insist on keeping the science in your science fiction work plausible? Well, I mean, I'd like to, but I don't allow that to be a limitation. Um, in my novel, Kiln People, for instance, I offer a highly implausible uh, scenario in which uh, we develop a machine that enables you to take clay temporary golems, human humanoid figures that last for about 24 hours and impress all your memories into them, your soul, basically as God is said to have impressed his soul, the soul into clay when he made Adam, the terracotta soldiers of Xi'an, the golem of Prague. So I'm taking venerable mythologies. I'm saying, what if science were to provide this? And I have no basis for suggesting that science will provide this. But once we start with that premise, let's run with it and see what society would be like if everybody could make four or five copies of themselves every day, send them out into the world, knowing everything that they know so they know what to do, um, and download their memories at the end of the day. Well, then you've been five versions of you every day. Can you imagine how much more you'd get done? But I found this was more a story about human personality than anything else because different human personalities would do different things with that power of self-duplication. Now, what's pertinent to your question is, am I all the time trying to think of the next near-term extrapolation? Of course not. Sometimes I do. I, uh, I, some stories deal with viruses, for instance, and the 
One fellow wrote to me after my story, Chrysalis, and said, uh, Bryn, your speculation about what cancer really is, is the one thing you'll be known for 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little scary thing to say, but you'll notice I just bragged it. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, sometimes you just take a premise and you say, you know, what would people do with something like this? I mean, what if we could, with some prosthetics and training, teach everyone to fly like Superman? What would the traffic jams be like in our cities? And what if it hurt a little? Would people every all the time complain about getting to fly the way we complain about having to spend six hours in an aluminum tube to cross a, con a continent that our ancestors slaved and sweated to cross for a year and most of them died? Um, so the theme in that case was ingratitude. The theme is... Uh, of killing people is is um, how can you be more than you already are with just the talents you already have if you just had more time. In my novel Earth, uh, and that's the one that gets the highest scores on the predictive sites, there's all sorts of predictions made in that novel in 1989 that seem to have come true. One that hasn't come true is a, a speculation that uh, if it were possible to make micro black holes and if they could reflect uh, gravity waves, then you'd have the ingredients for a gravity laser. And what is a laser? A laser is essentially two mirrors on both sides of an energy energized environment. <laughs> if uh, energy is released that happens along the path of the two mirrors and there are Einsteinian stimulated emission coefficients in that medium, then you're likely to get stimulated emission of amplification of that um, medium, of that, uh, of that um, type of radiation. Well, I speculate about that in, um, in my novel Earth. That doesn't mean that anybody is about to ma either make micro black holes or find out if they can be used as mirrors. My job is to speculate sometimes in the near future and sometimes uh, into the slightly or even somewhat more than slightly implausible, but not impossible. Because it, as Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, the only way to find out what's possible is to step at least a little bit of a distance into the impossible. David, casually referencing the golem of Prague suggests to me that you might be Jewish. Well, I, yes, I have that background and passed it forward. Um, the, the notion that the world can be both imperfect and that it needs us is something that uh, appears in my fiction. I, um, I find it difficult to accept that um, this world was made the way it is and that it, it is flawless because it clearly is not. Clearly, we are picking up um, the tools of creation, the laboratory within which creation was made whether by a personified being or by a series of circumstances, that laboratory door was left open. The lights were on. The Bunsen burners were on. I mean, if we weren't invited in, then somebody made a serious mistake. <laughs> it is, of course, a Jewish concept that God created the world for us to perfect. That's, well, yes, of course. The, uh, the, the notion... Uh, the notion that uh, this world is both imperfect and worthwhile. Um, if you look at human history, many of the great sages said the same thing that Plato did in the allegory of the cave. And that is that our senses are imperfect. It is useless to demand that we have somebody 
find some perfect representation of objective reality, we always will be delusional. And um, this was said not just by Plato and Socrates, but also by Buddha and uh, Jesus, uh, Lao Tzu. Um, but the common conclusion is give up. Give up on this on this foil a uh, spoiled world. Give up on this uh, um, imperfect world. Your in inability, all your perpetual inability to know what is objectively true, and seek truth, quote unquote, through uh, abnegation of the soul, through logic, uh, through pure logic, through um, contemplation through uh, prayer until Al Galileo came along and he said, you're right, I, I can never know what is objectively true and I'm a fallible human being and I am gullible and, and all of that, but through reciprocal criticism because we don't share the same delusions, you can find some of my errors, I can find some of yours, we can experiment and find some of the ones that we both uh, fallaciously uh, believed. And even though we will never know what this table in front of us really is, we can carve away what it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Science can do that. We can carve away what's not true. And that's what science does. Science doesn't tell you what's true. Science tells you a myriad things that aren't true. And that helps, and it is incremental, and we can move forward. And one of the problems with uh, the current Enlightenment experiment in America, in the West, around the world, is that um, those who do not like the Enlightenment experiment are trying to do the same things they did to Periclean Athens, to Da Vinci's Florence, that they almost succeeded doing to Amsterdam, Renaissance Amsterdam, and that they've tried to do to this enlightenment experiment every generation for 250 years. And that has plunged us back into a pyramid of feudalism in which truth is declared at the top instead of truth is something that we carve away and then you carve away some, you carve away some, and we're constantly finding out what's not true. So, um, it's a process. It's a serious process. And it requires a relatively flat social system. Otherwise, those at the top, 6,000 years of history show, those at the top will always declare some truth and hire guys in spangled robes to tell everyone else, you better believe this or else. David, thinking at the intersection of spirituality and science and fiction, how have you dealt with utopianism or the notion of utopias in your writing? Well, I mean, uh, look, uh, people people claim that I'm some kind of a flaming optimist because I think there's a good 40% chance we're going to make it to a really good society, one that's capable of expanding into the galaxy. And um, it may be the first when asked to explain the Fermi paradox, uh, and that's the question of why we don't see vast signs of past advanced technological civilization, I've cataloged a hundred potential explanations from the ridiculous all the way to the sublime, but the number one uh, theory that I posit is that humans are exceptionally smart and nice. Now, that's a little bit jarring given how much self-criticism we pour across ourselves as being this nasty, horrible, rapacious species, and both are true. But the fact that we pour criticism upon ourselves and upon our leaders is a sign of the health, the fundamental health of the Enlightenment experiment. It means we can't afford delusion. So we teach our children through all these Hollywood mythos, suspicion of authority, diversity, tolerance, eccentricity, 
individualism. Uh, these are all lessons poured from every Hollywood flick. So when we criticize humanity as being so awful, we are reflecting one of the traits that might make us truly exceptional, and that is our ability to engage in self-criticism. In any event, I believe that uh, we are exceptional, and I believe that this civilization is exceptional within the exception. And I am very loyal to it because I, uh, I remember all my past lives and uh, um, I'm joking. Um, I remember all my past lives and the one thing that continues is not memory, but personality. And I had this personality in all my past lives and I was never allowed to live past 16. I was garroted, I was burned, I was stabbed, I was beheaded. And look at me now, I'm an old man, you know, honored in my society with children. Um, it's the first time that's ever happened. So, you know, any society that rewards this personality is gonna have my loyalty. And I think there are a lot of people out there who don't stop to reflect on that were so loud in their sanctimonious rage that they don't stop to realize that they'd be dead by now in any other culture. So uh, am I an optimist? Because I, I think that we have a 40% chance, only a 60% chance of failure with all the problems that we face. I mean, I did write a novel called Earth, after all, back in 1989, talking about climate change and other things. Well, I am an optimist because the market has a niche for me to, to be an optimist because optimism is so rare because everybody's getting off on dystopias and pessimism and yowling and screaming. I'm an optimist because of the market opportunity. It's an empty ecological niche. Uh, if everyone were talking about how great things are, and I do recommend Peter Diamandis's book, Abundance. Please give a link below. And Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature. There are good reasons for optimism. If everyone was optimistic, I'd be throwing bricks through windows. But there's plenty of bricks flying. So what I'm doing about it is I've created two series of YA novels that offer somewhat optimistic futures. Uh, in one of them, um, and I'll give you the link so you can put it below. Uh, the High Horizon series, um, aliens kidnap a California high school and live to regret it. <laughs> that ought to appeal to the YA readers. Uh, in the other one, I am mentoring a lot of young writers who write novels in what's called the Out of Time series. And the crux of it is that in the future, 300 years in the future, we have, there's a beautiful utopia. People have succeeded in finally cleaning up the mess left by the baby boomers. And it's a wonderful future, but all of a sudden, everybody in the galaxy who was trapped in their solar systems by that bastard Einstein, everybody gets a teleportation to the stars. And suddenly we need diplomats, warriors, spies, liars. And in this future utopia, they're nice people, but they've forgotten how to do all those things. So they reach into the past for heroes who do know how to do all those things to help them because this machine can also be used for time travel. But here's the MacGuffin. Only teenagers can teleport to the stars and only teenagers can survive time travel. So instead of getting the hero who saved the world when she was 45 years old. You have to get her when she was a dope in high school, 14 year old dope. Um, so anyway, you see how that's tailored to suit um, wish fantasies of teens uh, and to try to combat the dyspeptic, awful uniformity of stupid dystopias, useful dystopias. 1984, heck, even The Handmaid's Tale, at least warn about something. 
but Arrow Girl um, the, gathering uh, all sorts of uh, revolting revolts, revoltees against a, a Presidente who drips poison. Puh. You know, we can do better than that. David, your affiliation with NASA, can we read into that that NASA institutionally values science fiction in the way that it envisions its missions, what it wants to accomplish? Well, science fiction has been an increasingly good odor across my life when I first got started. <laughs> my, my, excuse me. Take your time. When I... Science fiction has been an increasingly good odor across my career. When I my novel first sold, there were people in my department who thought that it meant that I was not a serious scientist. Um, it, it used to be that all the literary com community publications like New Yorker and Harper's and Atlantic would issue hit pieces against science fiction every few years. Now they can't dwell on science fiction enough um, it's partly because science fiction has worked hard to become multicultural with Afrofuturism and all that sort of thing. I helped to get all that started back in the 80s. But um, there have always been people in uh, government and in business who have appreciated the notion of let's imagine a little bit outside the box. Uh, it's been 30 years that I've visited Washington and spoken at think tanks and well, heck, uh, COVID ended a five year streak of speaking every year at the CIA uh, to try to expand what possibilities they might want to include on their whiteboard, even if it at the very edge. Um, so NIAC was perfect for that because NIAC is the little section of NASA that is involved in uh, subsidizing uh, projects that are at TRL or technological readiness level one or even zero to see if they can be refined just $100,000, spend nine months refining your idea to see if you know, it's worth a little further investment. And then if so, you might get a phase two. And every year we give one phase three for a project that just turned out to be anomalously really cool. And on rare occasions, they just finish their phase one and then immediately get money from elsewhere. Money a lot more serious than now NIAC can provide. And when that happens, we all go, ah, great. Now, uh, do they appreciate me because of my science fiction? Well, maybe that was the case at the beginning. But in fact, when I attend conferences, and especially the symposia with all these, you know, a couple dozen uh, fellows with their projects, turns out my biggest use is my one talent, and that's asking questions. And I learned this at Caltech. Uh, and that is, can you understand the context of the speaker well enough to spot the question that hasn't been asked. That's how I got into uh, my uh, graduate work, actually. I was working for Hughes Aircraft. I was an engineer. I was working on a master's degree. I did work on the theoretical properties of polarized light. But I sat in on several different seminar series, and I started in the back, ask a question, uh, later on, I was in the middle with the grad students, and then people started, the professors started leaving me seats in the second row. And uh, somebody said, excuse me, who are you? And um, that was actually a, a pretty nice question. I, I remember being pleased by that, and I told them, you know, I'm just, a, you know, work at, I'm an engineer working at uh, my master's. And Hannah Salfang, you know, the Nobel Prize winner, invited me to, you know, full free ride. So uh, asking questions is highly to be recommended. And it turns out that that's actually the use that I am most useful for in um, NIAC. 
uh, not so much the science fiction, but uh, saying, have you thought of this? I'll give you three options, David. Have you already written your magnum opus? Is your magnum opus waiting to be written, or do you not believe in the concept of a magnum opus? I... Well... My wife certainly thinks I have a big one in front of me. Um, when I've moved farther along on these YA novels, which I consider to be my pay it forward, um, I feel I owe my fans uh, to complete my Uplift series, which is portrayed here in, this, in the image from Sundiver over my head which is set in the future. It's what the one I won all the series that I won all my awards in um, uh, about humanity in the future, raising up the intelligence of dolphins, apes, other animals, which I consider to be a very serious prospect. Um, whether or not I have time after that to write, you know, another G-A-N, Great American Novel. Well, I personally think existence is pretty darn close to um, my magnum opus. I mean, some people think The Postman, that's the one that Kevin Costner made into a, a movie that is visually and musically gorgeous and was faithful to the heart message of my book. Scooped out and threw away all the brains. But then again, you know, one has to be even tempered about this sort of thing. I mean, I mean, contemplate that. I mean, they made a movie of my book and it's gorgeous, big hearted and dumb. Well, you know, that's what my wife married. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I would say there's probably a more than 50 percent chance given lifespan that uh, the works that uh, pe future people will call my greatest works are behind me. I intend to keep defying that and I intend to make it not true. So there. <laughs> well, David, let's go back now in history. In high school, was Caltech, you know, growing up in the Los Angeles area, was Caltech the place for you to go? Was that what you really wanted to do? Oh, well, I had taken tours of Caltech and I was I was blatantly uh, doing, uh, I was a late bloomer academically. It wasn't until high school that I actually became one of those guys, you know, the honors programs and things like that. And then my last year, I just really took off. You know, I just blistered every test. Still, I did not expect to be um, admitted to Caltech. I was actually quite surprised. And I considered it to be almost a command. Um, I expected to go to UCLA. And I probably would have been much happier. Caltech was difficult. It was really, really hard. But I cannot, and I, you know, I didn't get the greatest GPA there. I, you know, I barely survived. I was in the hardest major. Astrophysics is a physics major plus extra courses. Um, and I did that because of the one evening that Richard Feynman spoke directly to me and gave me two commands. It was at a date at Page House. I mean, a dance at Page House. And he bowed to my date after we were felling around him. You know, he, he had a, he had drilled a hole in his Nobel prize and it was hanging from a chain around his neck from his turtleneck. And this was 1970, forgive him. <laughs> uh, and he bowed to me and said, uh, I want to borrow your date for this dance. Well, what, my left arm, my firstborn child, anything, you're fine. <laughs> so she went out there with him. She was delighted. Well, five minutes later, he comes back, you know, and he later wrote a paper about how the turtleneck is not an item of male clothing because he was just, you know, he was on the verge of, you know, uh, heat, heat prostration. And he came back to me and he said, you, you must take my place. 
Oh, by the way, it was a little ditty called Inagata da Vida, the last 25 minutes. Um, you must take my place. Well, naturally, I misunderstood him and I became a physics major. Uh, it did not work out well. But in any event, uh, I did come away from Caltech with probably the best education I could possibly have had. Because my exposure to ideas, even in those classes, I didn't get good grades, was fantastic. And the after class discussions and arguments with the teachers, unparalleled. And then I did something that I tell students at commencements at high schools and universities all over the place is I say, um, take a map of your campus, throw a dart at it. Wherever the dart lands, go to the nearest building, stand outside, roll dice, go to the random floor you chose, throw a ball down the hall so that you choose a random room, knock on that door and say, excuse me, what do you do here? Now, I didn't do it that, that systematically at Galtepec, but I did pretty much that. It led to three summer jobs. And it's one of the reasons why I came out of Caltech with, in effect, a generalist degree. And I use it every day. Yeah. David, this being the late 1960s and early 1970s, were you politically minded during this period? Well, as a child of the 60s, of course, I, I was very politically minded. It looked for a while there as if the United States of America was going to dissolve uh, in uh, violence and fury. Uh, we see that today, but anybody who would try to compare any post-World War year or any five post-World War years to 1968 is a fool. Any two-week stretch of 1968 would have killed any of these modern whippersnappers. I mean, uh, my father was 20 feet from Bobby when he was shot. The worst day of my life, Martin Luther King and so on. So when I got to Caltech in the fall, uh, it was a little bit of a blissful island where politics was only all over the place. I remember when um, everyone was running like mad that November, screaming and grabbing piles of wood and heading out to the corner of California and Lake to make a bonfire while the police just stood back because they knew the rumor was that Caltech undergraduates have the bomb. And uh, it was because Caltech had won its first football game in anyone's memory. Uh, and that was the reason why UCSD immediately dissolved their football team. They've never had a football team since. Uh, so yeah, sure. I mean, we're politically active. Uh, uh, of course, 1968 saw the complete almost complete dissolution of the Democratic Party. Uh, so, you know, what can you do when your nation is involved in a suicidal uh, romantic venture like uh, Vietnam? You, you, you hope the nation can write it out. And we did, barely. Uh, do I continue to be political? Well, one of the books I published uh, just in 2020 was uh, Polemical Judo. It's a book that got very little attention from the political or pundit casts, but it's all about um, 
jujitsu political techniques that nobody on the union side of the Ameri this phase of the American Civil War, and I think we're in phase eight of the American Civil War, nobody um, considers uh, using agile methods to try to deal with the uh, tsunami of lies. So I, I don't think I should really continue too much longer. We could, we could continue another day. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the topic that I wanted to just touch on was when you were at Caltech, were you aware what a glaring omission it was that there were no women undergraduates at Caltech? Was that something that was self-apparent? Um, well, yes. I mean, look, I mean, even those of us who considered ourselves to be feminists then were troglodytes by today's standards. But sure, we, we, we all wanted uh, this, uh, the all-male policy uh, to end. Um, and it did. Uh, first, uh, my freshman year, uh, they started bringing in um, a larger number of female grad students and a special one year visiting undergrads as an experiment. And then in the um, in 1970, instead of setting up a separate women's dorm, um, they were admitted into all the student houses. Uh, and uh, I still have friends from that clade of, of uh, very brave young women, because until it reaches about 30% or so, it's really an anomalous intense situation. And in that case, you know, they made up three, four percent of the population, undergraduate population, that first year. So um, it wasn't an untense situation socially, psychologically, but it was a transition that had to be gotten through. And now, you know, I think it's darn close to fifty percent. So, uh, Mazel Tov. Were you involved formally in some of the student committees that were agitating for women to be admitted as undergraduates? No, as in, as it was already planned mm -hmm. by the time I was a freshman. I mean, the plan was already underway. Uh, 1968, you know, who had time for anything? Uh, 69, you know, the plan. They they made the announcement. I mean, uh, this the. Those one year visiting undergrads were very successful. We're going to do it. So, um, you know, you, you should you should ask uh, one of the old farts who are older than me, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too young to have been involved in that decision. Now, was I involved in I did help mentor a couple of the first women undergrads. Uh, you know, I, I, I helped them, uh, you know, find their way around and, you know, it was offered my ear or my shoulder, but it, 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 it's not to say I'm, you know, did anything particularly special. In, in, in talking to these women, what struck you about their decision to come to Caltech? Oh, well, you know, some of them were courageous. They wanted to forge new frontiers. But if you get accepted to Caltech, it takes a bit of a force of will to say, oh, I'm going to turn that down. I mean, you know, how, you, you, do you turn down Caltech? I mean, I, I don't fault my, my uh, younger self at LA High School for saying, uh, Caltech invited me, UCLA. <laughs> You know, uh, I, uh, it's pretty much a command. Is your sense that this was entirely a bottom-up approach? <laughs> that it was the students who were pushing for this decision to be made? Or were there any allies in administration or faculty who also were pushing for this? Oh, no, I think it was uh, a fairly large degree, the faculty and the administration, who felt that the times they are a-changing. Um, there were definitely voices among undergraduates calling for it as well. 
but uh, I think it's, I think, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of undergraduates at Caltech were just, you know, swimming to survive. Yeah. Anybody stick out in your memory among faculty or administration that were really pioneers in supporting this decision? Really were out in front on the issue? Well, I think that uh, Peter Goldreich, I think he was out in front. Uh, Feynman spoke up for um, for, egal for egalitarianism. Um, but, you know, I think that it's... Uh, I, I really wouldn't have been in much of a position to say. I mean, who's going to confide all these ruminations in a Caltech freshman? Sorry. So how much ultimately did were you there to see women as part of the undergraduate student body? Was it just the one year? Oh, no, they arrived my junior year. And so it was junior year, senior year, and my additional quarter. So, you know, I, I, I saw them involved in their struggles and they, they had extra pressures to undergo. Uh, which were partly compensated for by the extra eagerness of anyone around them to give them help if they asked. So, uh, but I'm not going to denigrate the, I'm not going to minimize the degree to which these were heroes who um, were pioneers and deserve a debt of gratitude from everybody, not just the subsequent generations of women. Uh, a, a woman at Caltech right now is writing one of the books in my Out of Time series. Oh, <clears throat> I should mention, I met my current wife 34 years ago when she was a graduate student at Caltech. She finished her doctoral defense and I finished my novel Earth. And we folded up and sold off all our property, bought round the world passes and zigzagged around the world for exactly a year, arriving back in LA a year to the day later when our passes expired so we could get married. Now, uh, 11 months of that was spent in Paris for her postdoc. So it's not quite this romantic year zigzagging around the world. We did zigzag around the world and it was great, but we spent most of that year slumming on the left bank of Paris. Oh, what misery. So our kids are, are doubly cursed, doubly Caltech cursed. So there. David, just a few more questions to round out this story. Was your sense that Caltech, as you said, times were changing, was your sense that Caltech relative to its peer institutions in higher education was behind the times in admitting women to the undergraduate student body? Well, of course, but there was the monastic tradition. When I worked at Mount Wilson one summer, I was staying in the monastery. Um, if you look at the cloaks that doctoral, um, that people, uh, candidates for or winners of doctorates uh, use. You take off the mortar board and you pull up the cowl and it is a monk's cowl. And I'm always disappointed when I attend commencements and I don't see any, any um, newly fledged doctors doing that, you know, maybe um, moving around to the Monty Python chance bonk. Um, but the, the, um, the monastic traditions are a little hard to overcome, but you know, Bob Dylan was out there at times they are a changing and most people knew it was, knew it was changing. Um, I'll tell you this, when I arrived at Caltech, we still in the student house, we still had dress dinners three or four nights a week. Now it had relaxed. All you needed was a sport jacket and either a turtleneck or a tie. But on those evenings, everybody sat up straighter. There was just something about it. A lot of the guys hated it. And when it finally went away completely, 
they were happy. I was glad to sit up straight, you know, and look people in the eye instead of watching them just shovel in the food. And believe it or not, guys would bring dates to Friday night dinner because it was kind of cool, you know, kind of, the formality and the all of that. All of that went away within a year of the women arriving. Now, I'm not claiming it was their fault. The fact of the matter is, times they were a-changing, and they were changing fast. Um, but, you know, maybe the, maybe the complainers that this is going to uh, destroy the elan of student, of academic life, maybe they had a 1% point but they were 99% completely wrong. I mean, our job there was to become enlightened, exploratory, and fearless scientists. And um, having, having, stopping the waste of talent. And when we get right down to it, above, among the most of the great arguments of the Enlightenment and American political life today revolve around the question, why on earth would you want to waste talent? David, in the small role that you played, what are you most proud of in helping foster this transition? I'm most proud that uh, the couple of women undergraduates who I mentored generally thought of me as being more a good friend and a mentor than a geeky than a geeky twit. And proof of that is that 15 years later, they invited me to a big dinner. Um, and that would have been plenty of time for them to figure out whether or not to hold any grudges for dumb things I might have said. Uh, and instead to realize that, you know, I had all else being equal, been a positive figure in their time in a very tense place. <coughs> Finally, David, last question. You know, there's two motivations here. One is that you admit women because it's the right thing to do. The other is that it's actually in Caltech's self-interest, that it improves the Institute on any number of fronts. To the extent that you have kept in touch, you followed Caltech's development since you were an undergraduate. How have you seen the latter come to be a true statement? Could you repeat it again? So there's two basic motivations why Caltech would take this decision to admit women to the undergraduate student body. One is that it's the right thing to do, that you're responding to the times the other is m more a matter of self-interest, that it's, it's better for Caltech. It improves Caltech as an institution to have women as part of the undergraduate student body. To the extent... Uh, I, I, I don't see any conflict between the two. No, not that there's a conflict, but the question is, to the extent that you have stayed in touch, you followed how Caltech has developed... How have you seen that to be a true statement, that the admittance of women obviously has improved Caltech, has made it a better place? I, I, when you double your potential sources of talent, you are going to double your likelihood of bringing in people who can make use of the unique experience that Caltech offers. It's as simple as that. I think it's simple as that. And it's usually as simple as that. Most issues of justice are, uh, I would say at least 60% of all issues of justice boil down to stop wasting talent. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, email me and I will uh, respond with links to any of the things that I mentioned, like my YA series or uh, um, the video trailer to existence. I think that's the most fun you'll have in three minutes with your clothes on. Okay. 
Um, and um, I'm looking forward to it. David, thank you so much. Thank you specifically for struggling through with your voice. I'm really glad we were able to do this fantastic perspective that you've, you've provided. I do appreciate it.